Uh, first, I want to say that uh, if you are confused or you think I'm going too fast, you want to ask a question, just feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me. And then, as suggested by uh, Bernard, uh, I will put um, the notes of my talk in this Zoom chat. So let me put it again. so that you can download uh, the PDF notes of my talk. And in the middle of uh, the lecture, if you forget something that I said before, you can look at the notes, go back and look at the notes. I think it, it's helpful. So let's start. Um, the title of my mini course is uh, the Frobenius Structure Conjecture for Log Calabial Varieties. And the reference uh, is my paper with uh, Sean Keel on archive. So here is the plan of this mini course. Uh, first, I will talk about the statement of the Frobenius structure theorem and applications to cluster algebras and applications to the moduli space of log Calabial pairs. And in the second lecture, I will talk about skeletal curves, which is a key notion in the theory. In the third lecture, I will talk about deformation invariance, tail conditions, gluing, associativity, and the convexity. It's lots of properties about curve counting. And in the last lecture, I will talk about scattering diagram and the comparison with the work of gross hacking keel on cluster algebras, and then more details about application to the study of moduli spaces of Calabial pairs. Okay, so let's start the first session. Um, someone asks that he does not see the link of the lecture note. Uh, I, I can put it again. Anyway, it's in the chat, chat, you can just download. Otherwise, if you cannot download, I will also put it uh, on my website afterwards. So uh, let's start the first session, a statement of the main theorem and applications. So the motivation comes from mirror symmetry which is a conjectural duality between Calabial manifolds. So roughly, mirror symmetry says that for any, given any Calabial variety X, there is a mirror Calabial variety X check. And by the mirror symmetry uh, philosophy, one may build the mirror Calabial variety X check by counting curves in X. So the Frobenius structure conjecture of gross hacking keel is a precise yet simple formulation of this mirror symmetry philosophy for log Calabial varieties, uh, which boils down to intricate relations of counts of rational curves. And the first question is, uh, what curves do we count? So let me describe uh, the setup first for uh, the Frobenius structure conjecture. Uh, here is the setup. Uh, we fix K any field of characteristic zero. For example, you can take K to be complex numbers, uh, but our theory is algebraic. We do not use uh, the analytic structure uh, on C. And then we have uh, U, uh, an affine smooth log Calabial variety over K. So here by log Calabial, I mean, uh, it means that all log pluricanonical bundles are trivialized by the tensor power of some volume form. Um, I will give some examples of uh, log Calabial varieties later. And then we denote by K of U, the field of rational functions 
on our log color B of variety. And we denote, uh, and then we introduce a set SKUZ. The set is called uh, integer points in the essential skeleton of U. Uh, for the moment, it's just the words. I will explain uh, later uh, the mathematical meaning of uh, essential skeleton. But for the moment, it's just uh, terminology and we have an explicit description of this uh, set SKUZ as follows. So it's just zero disjoint union uh, of M nu, where M is a positive natural number and the nu is a divisorial valuation on uh, the field of rational functions, KU, where our volume form omega has a pole. So divisorial valuation, in other words, it's just uh, uh, given by some divisor on some compactification of U. So now uh, let's fix a normal crossing compactification u inside y with complement we denote by d. d is y minus u. So this is the picture. We have a y, uh, projective normal variety and uh, our log color b of variety u lives inside and d uh, is a divisor at infinity. So this is uh, our setup. Uh, and a base field of characteristic zero, um, some log color B of variety U, and then we consider for the moment just uh, this explicit set, which is just multiples of some divisorial evaluation. And then we also have some compactification. And the next, uh, we want to count rational curves uh, in U. So what are the curves that we want to count? So uh, we want to define some counts of rational curves. Uh, we are given, first we are given an n-tuple P1 to Pn denoted by this bold P, uh, where each uh, Pj is just a point in SKUZ. In other words, just some multiple of uh, some divisor. And we also, we are also given a curve class beta uh, inside NEYZ, cone of effective curves, uh, which lives in uh, the, uh, in the space of uh, one cycles uh, modulo numerical equivalence. So you can just think of it as a homology class. Here, we write a cone of effective curves and uh, in terms of uh, cycles, just so that our uh, description is purely algebraic. And the next, uh, since each point in this SKUZ has this explicit description in terms of uh, just some multiple of some divisor, so we write uh, pj equals mj nu j for all non-zero pj. And we assume that each nu j is just given by some component in D. This is always possible if we make a big enough blow up. And now the counts that we want to define is the following. So we define the count eta P beta to be the number of closed rational curves in Y of class beta that intersect the divisor DJ with order MJ for every non-zero PJ. Here is the picture. So that's all we want to count. Uh, just this kind of uh, red curves uh, in Y of given class beta uh, whose intersection with the boundary D is given by our n-tuple. Yeah, 
You mean intersect this order with some kind of tangency order, yeah? It's tangency, yes. Yeah, yeah. Tangency and, order MJ. And there's no conditions for components pi which are equal to zero, yeah? Uh, for pi equals to zero, they are somehow living in the interior of, okay. of the curve. Uh, there are no conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to, they should not go into the boundary. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so we j just define the count to be such red curves. And uh, uh, you may ask why the count is well defined. So let me also give a precise uh, mathematical formulation. But heuristically, it's just uh, uh, the, we count the set of such curves. So the precise mathematical formulation is the following. We consider uh, let H for the P beta be the space of maps from P1 with N plus one marked points. So we put P1 to Pn, small P1 to Pn, and we put also an extra marked point S uh, to Y. We consider the such space of maps satisfying the following conditions. Uh, first, for every non-zero PJ, we ask uh, FPJ to meet the in open part of the component DJ with order MJ. As Maxim said, tangency order MJ. And also we ask that there are no intersections, other, no other intersections with the boundary. And then uh, we ask that the class uh, F push forward of fundamental class of P1 is beta. And then we can prove a simple lemma saying that if we consider the map phi from our modular space of uh, such uh, maps to M0 N plus one times U, where M0 N plus one is just the modular space of uh, N plus one points in P1. So the first factor of our map phi is just the taking domain of uh, this, taking domain. Uh, and the second factor of our map phi is take evaluation of uh, the marked point S. So uh, we have a simple lemma saying that this natural map phi is finite et al over a Zariski dense open subset of the target. And this can be proved using the deformation theory of curves. And now uh, using this lemma, we can precisely define our counts. So now we can precisely define uh, our counts of rational curves, eta for the P beta to be simply degree of the finite a data map above. So let me recapitulate that uh, uh, in order to state uh, this conjecture of gross hacking keel, uh, we have to define some counts of rational curves. And uh, heuristically, we just count this kind of red curves, but uh, Mathematically, precisely, it's also very easy to count because we can set up this modular space and we show that the map is just uh, finite edal and then we just uh, take a degree of this finite edal map. And yeah. this is... Yeah, oh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Do you understand that you assume that there's no other intersection points of curve with the boundary? Yes. Yeah, because you didn't... Ah, ah, yes, it's written, sorry. sorry. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yes. So, yeah, oh, so. Tony, can I ask yeah. a question? Uh, sure. Very good question. So uh, I saw the formula uh, you gave, uh, sorry, let me pull that out. Uh, so, okay, so you assume that uh, 
Oh, so you assume that each PJ can be expressed as the linear combination of the VG, right? So the, the VG is actually, so all the VGs are actually the valuations on the, on the function field of the U, right? And uh, so those VG, uh, I'm, I'm not for sure. So those VGs are just given by like localizing the, uh, sort of like the real functions, uh, localizing the structure shift at the boundary strata, the generic points of the boundary strata. Right? Uh, this uh, uh, new J is supposed to be a Greek letter. It's just uh, the same as uh, some divisor at infinity for some compactification. Oh, I see, I see. So it's not a localization of something. Or, or okay, okay. It's just a divisor at infinity. I, I said the divisorial valuation, it's just the given divisorial valuation. In other words, it's just given by some divisor at infinity. So it's just the divisor. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we, it's a divisorial valuation of the field of rational functions on our variety, which is the same as some divisor. Oh, like, uh, yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks. No problem. So, yeah, so then uh, the count is very simple, just a degree of a finite Eidolo map. And uh, since it's just a degree of a finite Eidolo map, uh, we remark that these counts are sometimes called naive counts uh, in the sense that we make no use of virtual fundamental classes. So now uh, we have defined our counts and we see that our counts depend on two parameters, uh, both P and beta. And there is a natural question, if we vary, uh, our parameter, both P, uh, which is n tuple of uh, uh, points, just multiples of uh, uh, divisorial valuations, and uh, curve class, if we vary our parameters, we get infinitely many numbers, eta, P beta. So natural question is, uh, what is the relation between them? Um, in order to answer this question, let's assemble the numbers eta p beta into generating series uh, as follows. So first, uh, we want to assemble all the curve class beta. And we just uh, assemble uh, like this. We consider R to be this, uh, meaning the monoid ring of uh, this n e y z integer points in the cone of curves. In other words, uh, positive integer linear combinations of effective curve classes. So we let R be the monoid ring of this over z, which is uh, nothing but uh, just the direct sum of uh, a lot of copies of uh, z. Uh, and uh, with basis in n e y z, so we denote it's just a notation. We denote the basis vector to be z to the power beta. So it's just uh, the most uh, straightforward way to put all possible beta together. And the next, we want to assemble all the p together, and we consider a to be the free R module with basis inside SKUZ. So uh, we define A to be this free R module, which is simply just uh, copies, a lot of copies of R parameterized, uh, a lot of copies of R parameterized by points in SKUZ. And we denote the basis vector by theta P. So here, z to the beta and the theta p, they are just a notation. They are just notations. So all what we do are just put all the possibilities of beta and all the possibilities of p together, uh, nothing else. Uh, then uh, we want to put uh, all these numbers, eta, p, beta together, and we define uh, the following notion called Frobenius pairing. So we let 
this um, multilinear map from some product of A to R uh, be the R multilinear map, which sends the basis vectors, the basis elements, theta P1, theta Pn into uh, just sum over our count eta p beta uh, over all possible uh, choices of a curve class. So we define this Frobenius pairing just to put all possibilities of p and beta together. Is it some finite automatically? Ah, ah, yes, yes, it's yeah, yeah. a good question. Uh, so first I said there is nothing mysterious here. All what we do is the mo most straightforward way to put uh, all possibilities of parameters together. And the second, as Maxim remarked, uh, the sum uh, is actually a finite sum which follows from the affinities of U. So, uh, now with these uh, operations, we can state our main theorem. Um, called Frobenius structure, structure theorem. So we assume that U contains an open split algebraic torus. I will remark on this assumption a bit later uh, and then the following hold. Uh, first, the R multilinear map we just defined uh, from N, N's product of A to R uh, is degenerate. So this Frobenius pairing uh, assembling together all the counts, it's a non-degenerate pairing. Mm. Non-degenerate means this, and the usual notion of uh, non-degenerate for pairing. And the second, second, there exists a unique finitely generated commutative associative R algebra structure on A such that, so, uh, for the moment, A is just a, a free R module. And the theorem says that on this R module structure, we ex there exists a unique uh, finitely generated commutative associative R algebra structure, such that first, this base, basis vector theta zero is one uh, in the algebra. And the second, if we take uh, the pairing of n elements a1 to a n, then this is equal to the trace of the product uh, multiplying a1 to a n using this algebra structure. Here by trace, we mean uh, taking the coefficient of theta zero inside this uh, product. So this is the second statement. And uh, third statement. So uh, now let's consider TD uh, some the split torus with co-character group generated by the irreducible components of D. And we have, uh, then we have a natural equivariant uh, action of uh, TD on this family. So uh, we start with A, just some R module. And in the second statement, we equipped A with some algebra structure. So now we are able to take a spec uh, of this A, which maps to spec of R because A is R algebra. And we denote spec of A by V. So uh, from the uh, motivations of mirror symmetry, 
we call A the mirror algebra and uh, curly V the mirror family. Uh, they are just uh, words for the moment. And uh, statement three says that we have some uh, torus generated by irreducible components of D and it acts uh, equivalently on this mirror family, just spec A over spec R. Um, for probably it doesn't make much sense, uh, just a single statement as this, but uh, I will explain later that this equivariant action is uh, very useful. So uh, we have this family and recall that our R is uh, defined over integers. Our base spec R is defined over integers. It was just a monoid ring over these curve classes. In other words, positive integer uh, combinations of uh, effective curve classes. Oh, oh Donny, small question. Is this monoid finitely generated or not? Ah, it's not necessarily finitely generated. Not necessarily, but uh, later when we really need it to be finitely generated, uh, we will do something. For the moment, uh, it's not. Yeah, so we have this spec R uh, and it's defined over Z and now let's base change to Q. So yeah, although this spec R is bad, it's not finitely generated, but this family is good. Uh, as we will see, it's uh, relatively good. So spec R is defined over Z and now let us base change to Q. And uh, we define VQ to be spec AQ uh, to uh, spec RQ, just to base change this map to Q. Uh, then statement four says that this uh, family over Q is a flat family of uh, affine varieties of the same dimension as U. Uh, each fiber of this family is a Gorenstein semi-log canonical and a K trivial, meaning that the canonical uh, class is trivial. And moreover, the generic fiber of this family is log canonical and log calabial. So here, uh, if you are not familiar with the words Gorenstein, semi-log canonical, or log canonical, they are just uh, conditions on singularities. So somehow it just says that uh, we get a flat family of uh, affine varieties of the same dimension as U with uh, some uh, manageable singularities. Uh, it's unreasonable to expect uh, everything to be smooth. Uh, so, but we have a pretty good control on the singularities and the generic fiber is uh, a log Calabria variety. Oh, 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 uh, Tony, yeah, so it's yes. not smooth. Uh, generic fiber is also not smooth in general. Uh, in general, it's possible that none of the fibers are smooth. Yeah, but can you apply your original construction to also varieties with some kind of singularities like those which you obtain? Because you assume you start with smooth variety and went to some non-smooth varieties. Yes, so in our paper, we only consider the smooth case, but it's possible also to extend to singular case. And for that, one has to be as more technical at many places, but uh, theoretically it is possible uh, possible also to start with singular and uh, obtain singular. Maybe uh, after uh, I explain more details in the construction, you will see better uh, like we can actually just uh, uh, remove the smoothness assumption. So may I ask? Yes. Uh, so you, 
what do you mean by the, well, what, what's about the singularity class? You allow log terminal singularity for it? Uh, for the moment, uh, we just assume our log Calabria to be smooth. Uh -huh. But you said that you can extend to some mildly singular. Yeah, but uh, it's, uh, it's technical and uh, we didn't really. Uh, so of course uh, we have the singularities has to be co-dimension at least two. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, then we guess log canonical should be good enough, but uh, we haven't yet checked all the details. Sorry, but, uh, question. And also, uh, that's mm -hmm. not our first priority for the moment to extend to singular case because uh, actually in the singular case, we can just uh, make blow up uh, and assume uh, smooth. Then we will lose uh, the affinities. So somehow these are, these, they are related, these questions. Mm -hmm. Mm. So sorry, another question is uh, the what you mean by log Calabria? Ah, so do uh, you do you uh, have have some natural compatibility? Ah uh, yes, this is a very good question. So actually, we also have a, a natural compactification of this family V. Uh -huh. uh, let's denote uh, say the compactification is X, and then by log Calabria, I just mean that. Uh, uh, Kx plus the boundary divisor mm -hmm. is uh, trivial. And the pair is Lc. Uh, oh. The pair is, uh, yeah, is uh, uh, generic. Yeah, the generic fiber is uh, log canonical. Uh -huh. As a pair. As a pair. Also, uh, yeah, for the interior and also as a pair. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Oh, sorry, Tony. Can I ask yes. a dumb question? Yeah. Uh, so you said that each generic fiber is a log Calabria, right? So yes. which means that for each generic fiber, you actually choose the compactification. But w so this compactification is consistent for the whole like family, or it's just each fiber will have its own like a special compactification. Uh, the compactification is for the whole family uh, okay. over spec R, and you will see that I will mention uh, later today that. Uh, we can not only compactify uh, fiber-wise, but we can even compactify the base. And uh, finally, we can make everything to be compact. Oh. And uh, that's why I mentioned in the beginning that uh, we can apply our theory to the study of the modular space of uh, log Calabria pairs. So we obtain compactification of uh, modular space. Oh, okay, sounds good. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So, yes, so this is a fourth statement uh, of the main theorem. Uh, first is non degeneracy, second is existence of algebra structure, third is uh, uh, equivariant torus action, and the fourth is uh, singularities of the uh, mirror family. So, let me make some remarks. Uh, first uh, remark, we can remove the dependence of our mirror algebra A on the compactification Y uh, by setting all curve classes to zero. So somehow, uh, if we ignore curve classes, then the compactification doesn't really matter. All what matters is U. So we set all curve classes to zero by taking tensor product, uh, we denote this by AU, and we take a tensor product uh, with Z over R, where R maps to Z, uh, sends every Z, uh, Z to the beta to one. In other words, sending all beta to zero. So the compatification doesn't really matter. Uh, we can ignore it if we forget the curve classes. And second remark, the assumption that U contains a torus always holds in dimension two 
but not always in dimension three. And this assumption plays two roles in our theory. Uh, first, uh, it allows a degeneration of our mirror family to a toric variety. And this is crucial for the proof of one, which is non-degeneracy, and for the proof of four, which is the study of singularities. And the second role it plays is that it greatly simplifies the enumerative part of the theory. So, uh, in fact, the enumerative part of the theory, uh, one can have a more sophisticated uh, enumerative theory in order not to use uh, this Torres assumption, uh, but uh, it's more technical. And in fact, that many geometric ideas of the enumerative theory are already uh, present and are much easier to illustrate in this uh, simplified situation. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Tony. One question: it's, it's because this condition theory really looks out of blue. This containing Cantorus, does it have also hold for mirror family of varieties? Uh, in in some cases, it also holds. Like we have to assume some. Not always, but in the final case, I think it always holds. Yeah. And also, uh, I told you to use it because if contains this local ABO contains the torus and contains infinitely many torus by mutations, more or yes. less. Uh, yeah, by so we will see the mutations later. I see. Mm. So, uh, but we still, uh, although we used uh, this uh, assumption and we conjecture that the theorem should probably still hold without the assumption. And then I want to mention that the original conjecture of uh, gross hacking keel is a variant of this theorem, uh, which was stated via logogram of written invariants instead of uh, naive counts of rational curves. So the statement uh, is uh, more complicated involving logogram of written invariants and which does not have the torus assumption. And uh, Gross and Siebert, they are working on the mirror construction problem in greater generality using their uh, theory of punctured log curves. And it is not evident uh, whether their mirror construction will coincide with ours using non-Archimedean curves. Uh, recently, uh, there is a, a preprint by Mark and uh, uh, Julia, uh, which showed the comparison in some uh, special cases. But in general, uh, it's not clear to how to compare uh, log invariants with non archimedean invariants. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the main theorem. And uh, now I would like to talk about uh, structure constants of the mirror algebra. Sorry, may I ask one more question? Yes. Uh, so when you define this naive count, so you already assume the rationality? Oh. Rationality of what? Of the, I mean, uh, your variety. The, uh, no, uh, you, it's not necessary. Uh, for uh, the naive count, we just, uh, for any log Calabria, for any affine smooth log Calabria. I see. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, let's recall that uh, the second statement of our theorem says that there exists a unique finitely generated commutative associative algebra structure. And it's stated as existence, but we have a concrete uh, uh, construction of the multiplication on this algebra. So uh, let me now uh, describe what is construction 
of uh, structure constants of this mirror algebra. Uh, that is, uh, we want to answer the question that how are products defined in the mirror algebra? Um, uh, recall uh, the mirror algebra A as a module, it's just a free uh, R module with basis parameterized by uh, points in this SKUZ, which are just multiples of uh, divisorial valuation. So uh, in order to define products, it's enough to define what the product does on uh, basis elements. So given P1 to Pn uh, in SKUZ, which is just multiples of some divisor, uh, we write the product in the mirror algebra A as the following. So we take a product of these basis elements, theta P1 to theta Pn, and it's, it will be an element in A. So since A is a free R module with basis in SKUZ, so we can write this element as sum over all uh, Q in SKUZ of this basis vector theta Q with some coefficient. And this coefficient is in, is in R. And we recall that R is uh, this is a monoid ring over curve classes. So we can again write this as sum of all possible curve classes uh, over all possible curve classes of this basis vector z to the gamma and of some with some coefficient. And we denote this coefficient by chi p1 to pn q gamma. And uh, this chi is just called the structure constants. So this formula for multiplication is just uh, unfolding uh, the definition of A as R module. Just uh, write it in terms of basis and then the coefficient is called structure constants. Um, so here is the idea for the definition of structure constants. Um, inspired by Contasevich homological mirror symmetry, we would like to define the structure constants chi as counts of uh, holomorphic disks. Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, disks do not make sense in algebraic geometry. So uh, we have to go to analytic geometry. Sorry, sorry, I like to interrupt. Uh, yes. I have a question. Is that uh, what is the inspiration behind this uh, count chi as a kind of count of holomorphic disk using conservative homological mirror symmetry? Means, can you give the idea? I did not understand it really. Yeah, because uh, uh, homological mirror symmetry says uh, some equivalence of categories between Fukaya category and uh, uh, it's like uh, Fukaya category and the derived category of coherent sheaves, then one can try to think uh, how do we represent functions on the mirror side because here this, uh, these elements, they are like functions on the log color B of variety. So how do we see this kind of products from the picture of symplectic geometry in the Fukaya category side? And then we will see that uh, they should somehow be determined by counts of holomorphic disks. So which side is counting? I, I understand this side is counting, the sky is counting some uh, Fukaya yeah, this is a theta is on which side? These thetas are on which side? In this coherent shift sides or in the Fukaya? So category? if you want to think in terms of mirror symmetry, uh, here where we count, it's the A side. And what we obtain, this theta there on the B side. Okay, okay. Yeah, but this is just a heuristic idea uh, from homological mirror symmetry. And uh, it suggests to count some holomorphic disks. Oh, sorry, to, to, to interrupt, there was, I think it will be some possible confusion. You have your variety um, 
you and have compactification, yeah? Yes. Yes. And before you say that you can always arrange compactification so it goes to individual devices, not to intersection of devices. Yes. Yeah. But now, but when you make generating series here, you put, uh, you consider numeric effect of classes in some fixed compactification. Well, I said fixed the compactification. Yeah, yeah, yes. so, yeah. So now curve will go to intersections of divisors, which you never mentioned. Yeah, but uh, when we make this generating series, yeah. for example, uh, when we make, uh, where is the generator? Yeah, yeah uh, when we make this generating series, this Y is a fixed compactification. Ah, ah, so in the compactification, we have more complicated pictures. Going no, uh, this Y is a fixed compactification, but yeah. when we count this eta, yeah. we make some arbitrary blow up, yeah. and then this is just sum over all possible curve classes on the blow up, which ah. projects to beta. Ah, yeah, okay. It's just a temporary, one can make a temporary blow ups. Uh, is it clear? Okay, yeah. No, okay. Yeah, so, but this is just a way of, uh, of uh, uh, like a technical detail. One can also use, if one doesn't like a temporary blow up, then one can use the log Gorom of Witten invariance uh, by Gross and Siebert and work with, uh, with, with the curves going into corners. So either one make a blow up uh, or one use a log, log invariance. Okay. Mm, yeah, so yes. So by homological mirror symmetry, one can construct the count, uh, this uh, structure constants by counting some holomorphic disks. But unfortunately, disks do not make sense in algebraic geometry. So let's go to analytic geometry. Oh, sorry, Tony, to interrupt you, actually. Yeah. So, uh, uh, even though I, I, I definitely agree that even though uh, it doesn't really make sense for accounting of the holomorphic disks, but uh, is it possible to define those uh, structure constants by using the tropical, like, tropical counting stuff? Because so I feel were... like there's an interpretation of the, like, uh, the counting of the holomorphic disks by using the tropical curve counting stuff. Yeah, I mean, we will see how tropical curves come later uh, in the theory, but this count is not a purely tropical count. It's actually the multiplicities of the count cannot be seen always from the tropical picture. It's like a combined tropical and analytic. Oh, great. Somehow multiplicities, like when you count the tropical curves, for example, you apply the Mikalkin multiplicity formula. Because we ju not just count combinatorial objects, we uh, also need to count with multiplicity. And uh, in the toric case, one apply Mikalkin multiplicity formula. But uh, here we are not in the toric case and the multiplicity does not, one can not just read it out from the combinatorics. Oh, sorry to, to just also to say it's inspired by mirror symmetry. Do you mean some, there are some, imagine some Lagrangian varieties somewhere or uh, corresponding to this theta basis elements? Do you have clear picture? Oh, so, you mean how to compare with symplectic cohomology? Yeah. yeah. Yes, this is also possible. I think as long as the symplectic cohomology are rigorously defined, uh, it's also possible to compare with like, uh, you mean uh, horizontal ah, so like something like, Ho like Hochschild cohomology, yeah, more or less calculation. Yes, yes, Hochschild the cohomology of the Fukaya category. Yeah, I see. So, sorry, but then, then this Lagrange, uh, these thetas are in the coherent, shape, coherent side, not in the, on the sheaf side. How the Lagrangians give these thetas? Because just previous remark you made this this, this side, structures constant coming from the Fuka, I mean, it's Lagrangian thing, but uh, how these thetas is related to this Lagrangian, I didn't understand. Yeah, theta is on the B side and the chi is, the counts are on the A side. That's what, how mirror symmetry works. Yes, yes, but the, the, the coherent shifts, this, uh, you are counting the coherent shifts are 
not on the Lagrangians are coming from the A side. Is it wrong or am I wrong? Yeah, they are on the A side. Coherent shifts are on the B side. And yes. here, theta are like sections of the coherent shifts. And so what is the relation with this Lagrangian that Maxim says? Yeah, it's maybe it's too complicated. I think it's better, yeah. Yes, so the yeah. thing I want to emphasize is that this is a lot of uh, very powerful heuristic picture of homological mirror symmetry, uh, which uh, suggests a lot of uh, these uh, kind of uh, mysterious constructions we make. But uh, what is good about the, the story here is that we will just make everything algebraic. And uh, so it stays purely in algebraic geometry. And uh, we, and everything we can have a rigorous foundation. Uh, yeah, so, yes. So we want to count holomorphic disks, but it doesn't make sense in algebraic geometry. So we go to uh, analytic geometry. And uh, of course, uh, the first choice one try is uh, complex analytic geometry. But uh, it doesn't uh, work well because if we count disks in complex analytic geometry, as suggested by the homological mirror symmetry conjecture, we obtain a complicated curved A infinity structures. And it's not clear how to get uh, well defined counts uh, from these structures. So our, uh, the solution is to use non Archimedean analytic geometry. And uh, then we can actually have a very simple and direct definition of the structure constants by counting non-Archimedean curves. So I will explain this in a second, how to count these uh, non-Archimedean curves. And, uh, but uh, however, studying uh, the properties of uh, such counts uh, requires more work which will be explained in later lectures. So today I will just uh, uh, first explain like uh, what, what is this uh, simple direct definition uh, of structure constants by counting non-Archimedean disks. Um, so uh, yeah, so to count non-Archimedean curves first, uh, we have to go to non-Archimedean geometry. So with the better sum, have some non-Archimedean field. <clears throat> and it's very simple. We have our base field K and we just equipped, equip our base field K with the trivial absolute value, which is, uh, which sends any non-zero element to one and which sends zero to zero. So for example, even if we start with uh, the field of complex numbers, we just ignore uh, the usual uh, complex uh, uh, norm, complex uh, norm, and we replace it uh, with the trivial absolute value. Uh, then all of a sudden, this uh, K becomes a non-Archimedean field. So that's how we apply non-Archimedean geometry here. And since K is a non-Archimedean field and our log Calabria variety is defined over K, we can apply Bayakovitz analytification uh, to our K variety U and we obtain U on its analytification. It's a K, a K analytic uh, space in the sense of Vladimir Berkowitz. And <clears throat> this, con this uh, construction has many analogous properties to complex analytification. Mm, just uh, for your information, if you have never seen this non-Archimedean analytification, it's uh, quite easy to de describe the underlying set of the K-analytic space. So uh, the underlying set consists 
just of pairs cosi nu, where cosi is a scheme theoretic point of u and nu is an absolute value on the residual field uh, at cosi extending the absolute value on k on our base field, which is uh, in the trivial value, value of the case, the extending condition is vacuous. So nu is just uh, an absolute value on the residual field. And we see from this description that uh, the set SKUZ, which we defined explicitly as uh, multiples of divisorial valuations, they, uh, it just lives inside the UR because they are just uh, absolute values on, on the residual field of the generic point. They are valuations on uh, the field of rational functions, which is just the residual field of the generic point. So they, it lives inside. And by assumption, uh, our U contains a torus. We denote our torus by TM, M being the co-character lattice. Then uh, since this only depends on the generic point, we have SKUZ is the same as the SK of the torus. And one can compute easily that this SK of the torus is just the, the co-character lattice. Yeah, so that's all about uh, uh, compact, uh, all about identification. And now we are in purely non-Archimedean world. And recall that our goal is to define the structure constant chi P1 to Pn Q gamma by counting non-Archimedean analytic disks. So again, uh, let me first also give the heuristic picture. So heuristically, what are we counting? Heuristically, uh, what kind of non-Archimedean disks we are counting? Uh, so here is the picture. Yeah, so heuristically, we define this structure constant chi p1 to pn q gamma uh, as the number of this kind of red uh, disks. So it's the number of disks delta, this red disk delta in y on, such that first we ask, uh, such that first, uh, we ask that uh, the disk intersects uh, every dj with order mj. And second, we ask the boundary of the disk to go to the point u, uh, to go to the point q. Remember, I explained that this SKUZ just lives in the identification of u. So in particular, the point q the Q becomes a point in the identification of U. So we just ask the boundary of the disk to go to U, uh, to go to Q. And uh, in fact, in non-Archimedean geometry, the boundary is a single point. Uh, here I drew a heuristic Archimedean picture, but uh, the non-Archimedean picture, in the non-Archimedean picture, the boundary is a point. It's always easier to think in terms of the Archimedean picture. Uh, and the next condition is that we ask that if we compute derivative uh, of this disk at the boundary, then we want the derivative also to be equal to Q. Here Q is sort of as a direction. And this notion of derivative we can make sense of this notion of derivative using the theory of skeletal curves that I will explain later. And the last condition so is that- what, what is the meaning of derivative? Means what, what, for, for what derivative of what? 
was uh, why, why do you want to calculate what, what is the derivative here it will be late to explain uh, grub yes it's, don't worry, uh, it's don't worry. Uh, yeah. We have a map from disk into the variety. So it's the derivative of this map. This disk lives inside the variety. So here we have a derivative. And the precise sense uh, should, can only be understood using the theory of skeletal curves. Because here when we make a derivative, they are, it's not clear where to go. Uh, and the final condition is we ask the curve class of this disk in the limiting sense to be gamma. So this is uh, the heuristic picture for the counts for structure constants. And maybe I think it's a good place to make a break. Five okay. minutes break. Okay. Oh, Tony, may I ask you a question? Very quick yes. question. So you so the in the second condition said uh, so the boundary of the uh, delta maps to the Q right uh, which is a point in the Bergwich analytification, but uh, in your picture it's not really mapped to a Q. It's just the uh, the boundary of the contains the Q right something. Yeah, because uh, this is the Archimedean picture. Then oh. the boundary is S one. Oh, I see. I see. Great. But in the non-Archimedean picture, I think later I also have some non-Archimedean picture you will see that the boundary really maps to Q. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once, oh, okay, okay, I see. I see. Okay, okay, so I'll make a small break for till 35, uh, 11, 35. Or 37. Or 37, yeah, good. So I just resume. Yeah. Yes, so, yeah, so uh, we want to define structure constants, chi, by counting non-Archimedean disks, and heuristically, we just count this kind of red disks. But uh, there is a trouble, is that unlike the situation for counting closed curves above, uh, the space of all such disks satisfying these conditions is in fact infinite dimensional. And the question is, how can we extract a finite counting number from this infinite dimensional space? And the idea is just to add one more condition. So these four conditions are uh, conditions that somehow suggested by homological mirror symmetry heuristics. And now we want to add, but they are not sufficient. They, the, we want to add sufficiently many conditions to have a, a finite dimensional space. And now we want to add one more condition uh, in order to reduce to finite dimension by imposing a regularity condition on the boundary uh, of our disk delta called the toric tail condition. Uh, so we ask that uh, we ask that by analytic continuation, since we are in analytic geometry, we can do analytic continuation at the boundary. We ask that our disk extends to a closed rational curve uh, in Y on, satisfying the following two conditions. So first, if we write Z to be the opposite of Q and uh, then Z is just some multiple of some divisor we denote by DZ. Then we ask the tail T to hit uh, DZ, the divisor DZ with order MZ. Mm. Yeah, and the second, we ask that the punctured tail, uh, which is the tail T minus uh, this hitting point Z, we ask the punctured tail to lie inside our torus. And this is one more extra condition we impose somehow about the boundary of our disk. And then uh, this toric condition together with all the previous 
heuristic conditions uh, implies that we obtain a finite account of non-Archimedean disks. So that's the heuristic picture. And uh, uh, in fact, the precise mathematical formulation is not so complicated. And I can also give it uh, fairly quickly. So let me do it here. Uh, what is the form precise mathematical formulation in order to realize this heuristic idea? So first step, we have to figure out the class of the added tail. Since uh, we, I mean, we only uh, specify the class of the disk and now we have an extra tail, we need to figure out the class of the tail and the claim is that the class of the tail is just equal to the class of the closure of any general translation of the one parameter subgroup in the torus given by the point Q. And this is easy to see from tropical picture. So first step, we figure out the class. And the second step, whenever we want to count something, we the better set up the moduli space for these extended curves. So, uh, so recall that uh, now we have an extra divisor, dz. Z was the opposite of Q. And we add this extra Z into our tuple. We used to have an N tuple, P1 to Pn. Now we add it one more Z. And we also have a beta extended curve class. Uh, then as in the definition of counts for the Frobenius pairing, we consider the moduli space H PZ beta, uh, where we marked, uh, we mark label uh, with, where we label all the marked points. Now we have N plus two marked points. We label all the marked points as P1 to PN and ZS. So we are just setting up the moduli space for this extended curve and we use almost the same moduli space as in the definition of the Frobenius pairing. And we recall that uh, this moduli space we used in the definition of Frobenius pairing consists just of rational curves in Y of class beta whose intersection numbers with the boundary D are given by our tuple PZ, just the moduli space of closed rational curves. And recall that we also have a natural map taking domain of our rational curve with marked points, uh, taking domain. So we go to the moduli space of P1 with N plus two marked points. And we also take evaluation of S of the extra mark point. That's the second step. And the third step, so now uh, we want to define uh, the counts, count as degree of something. So we better pick something. Uh, uh, so we should pick uh, first some point in this first factor. We pick the right modulus in the first factor and we let mu be the divisorial valuation given by the divisor in the natural Delin-Mann for the compactification, uh, parametrizing nodal curves, which has a node separating the first n marked points with the last two marked points. This gives a point mu, and then we uh, let q tilde be the pair consists of mu in the first factor and the q in the second factor. And recall by deformation theory that our map of phi is a finite a tau over a Zariski open of the target. 
therefore, uh, this if we take, but this point it's a very generic point. So it lives in any Zariski open. So if we take a pre-image of this point, it's finite. So more precisely, it's finite over the residual field at this Q tilde. So uh, somehow we want to take this degree of this finite analytic space as our count. But if we think for a second, uh, we realize that not all curves in this pre-image are extensions of uh, disks by toric tails because they can have uh, wild stuff uh, and we want to discard those uh, wild uh, curves. Then for the last step, we impose the toric tail condition. And uh, so here is the toric tail condition. So we define a map F from rational curve with n plus two marked points uh, to y n is said to satisfy the toric tail condition if the following holds. Um, so now I have uh, drew the non-Archimedean picture of uh, this curve. And uh, you see that the non-Archimedean picture of a uh, curve is a tree. And uh, we have uh, many marked points, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, Z, S. Then we let gamma be the convex hull of all the marked points, which will be the red part, union the blue part. And uh, since it's just a tree, since C is rational, it's just a tree, we have a canonical retraction from the tree to gamma. And then the tail is simply the pre-image of the retraction of the interval connecting S and Z. So this part is tail. And the toric tail condition is to ask that the punctured tail lives inside the torus, F T minus Z, this blue part together with all the green small pieces is our tail. And we ask this part minus Z to live in our torus. In other words, the punctured tail lies in the torus. So finally, we let F be the subset of this finite set uh, satisfying the toric tail condition. And now we are ready for the precise definition of a structure constant. So we just define our structure constant to be a chi, to be the length of F. Mm, since F is a zero dimensional scheme, it's just a length or degree. In other words, it's just the cardinality after passing to algebraic closure. So uh, if you are lost uh, with this, uh, with this uh, precise uh, definition, it's not a problem. Uh, all I want to ex uh, say about this precise definition is that it's actually not so complicated to define this number. Although proving properties is a bit, bit more complicated, but just to give the precise algebra geometric definition, uh, it's quite simple. And then uh, we have the following theorem, which says that the structure constants defined as above, as lengths of this uh, F, uh, they are independent of the choice of torus. And furthermore, uh, for our multiplication rule, which we wrote like this, 
the sums. A priori, when we write a sum, it's a sum over infinite set. And a priori, this multiplication rule is just a formal multiplication rule. It doesn't give algebra structure. But we prove that these two sums are actually finite sums, and they give the finitely generated commutative associative R algebra structure on the mirror algebra A in the Frobenius structure theorem. Mm. So then I have a remark. Um, although, as I said, the precise definition of structure constants is uh, rather self-contained and st straightforward, but the proof of their properties uh, as in the above theorem requires more machineries to be set up, especially the deformation invariance and the theory of uh, spectral curves. And uh, uh, before we plunge into the technologies inside, uh, let us first illustrate uh, two applications of the Frobenius structure theorem uh, in research areas beyond the mirror symmetry and the enumerative geometry. So now uh, I will talk about uh, applications. And starting from next lecture, I'll talk about more, I'll talk more about the technologies uh, inside of this enumerative theory. Mm -hmm. There are no questions, I will continue. So the first application I would like to talk about is uh, to cluster algebras, and we make a comparison with the work of uh, Gross, Hacking, Kiel, Kondasevich on cluster algebras. Now here is uh, our theorem. Mm. So let uh, x, curly x, be a fock gontroff skew symmetric X cluster variety, uh, which is, I do not recall the definition, but uh, roughly it's uh, defined from some combinatorial data by gluing a lot of uh, torus. And uh, we assume that the algebra of global functions is uh, finitely generated and the, if we take spec of the algebra of global functions, we get smooth variety. And we also assume that uh, the canonical map from curly X to U is an open immersion. Yeah, uh, so it's something which you can, tr very hard to check, yes, it's in general, yeah. If you have general quiver and how to check that U is smooth, Yes, from combinatorial data, it's difficult to check. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, but uh, as I said in the beginning, it's possible to relax our smoothness uh, assumption. But uh, here I want to state this theorem more as an illustration of uh, like the idea of for the moment. So uh, example, yeah, these conditions, it's not easy to see from combinatorics, but uh, if we show the, that some nice uh, variety has cluster structure, then they are good. So for example, uh, double Bruja cells in- uh, Bru then, no, I, I, as a French uh, citizen should sell Bruja cells, not Bru Bru it's Bruja. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, cells are uh, in semi-simple complex Lie groups. Uh, they are examples of uh, of uh, such uh, Fock-Gontroff skew symmetric X cluster varieties. And now uh, we can apply our Frobenius structure theorem to this uh, cluster variety and we obtain our mirror algebra. 
So here, we don't uh, specify any compactification for this log color BL variety. And uh, as I remarked above, it's okay, because as long as we set all curve classes to zero, then our mirror algebra AU is independent of any compactification. And the next, uh, let's denote by mirror X, uh, the combinatorially defined mirror algebra of uh, gross hacking keel Kondasevich. Uh, then the following hold. So uh, first, we prove a comparison theorem saying that the combinatorially defined structure constants in the mirror algebra, mirror so X. I have a question on the notation. It's, uh, you have a uh, uh, car curly chi on for culture of skew schematic matrix on X, and then what is Y here? It means I bit miss. I'm just ah. Uh, y is here. any compactification of U. And X is here. What is X here? Then what is curly X? No, no, the skew symmetric. Sorry, I... this X the X cluster variety is just a terminology. Okay, this X is doesn't uh, mean some variety. It's just X cluster is a word. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. No problem. So. Uh, we prove comparison theorem saying that the combinatorially defined structure constants on the mirror algebra in GHKK are equal to our geometrically defined structure constants on our mirror algebra AU. So this gives an isomorphism between our AU and their mirror algebra. And the second, uh, the mirror algebras are independent of choice of cluster structure. Uh, in other words, they are canonically determined by the variety U. So that just follows from the first because uh, our mirror algebra is independent of choice of the torus inside. It's associated canonically to the variety, while it's not clear from the combinatorial construction. Mm. So let me mention some consequences of this comparison theorem. First, uh, let's recall that our naive counts are always non-negative integers, because it's just defined as a degree or length of some scheme. So they are obviously non-negative integers. And this gives a much more conceptual proof of the positivity of the structure constants and also of the coefficients of the scattering diagrams, which in, turns, uh, in turn implies the positivity in the Laurent phenomenon for cluster algebras. So I will explain probably in the last lecture uh, some ideas in the proof of the comparison, which we uh, have to use some wall crossing structure or scattering uh, diagrams. And we compare not only the structure constants, but also uh, the scattering diagram. And this comparison, uh, since our numbers by definition are just uh, non-negative integers, and this implies uh, the positivity result for cluster algebras, uh, whose original proof, I think now it has uh, several different proofs. Uh, and here we give a geometric proof. Uh, and the second consequence is that we obtain a proof of GHKK broken line convexity conjecture, uh, which is uh, some conjecture about the convexity property of uh, broken lines in the paper of GHKK, which is not easy to see from the combinatorial construction, 
but uh, it uh, follows uh, quite easily from the geometry of non-Archimedean analytical curves. And the third uh, consequence of the comparison theorem is that we can remove some technical assumption uh, in GHKK's paper for the construction of the mirror algebra. So the, the technical assumption is called EGM assumption, uh, which is short for enough global monomials. And in GHKK's paper, the algebra, mirror algebra structure on what they call uh, the canonical uh, algebra, the algebra structure uh, can only be defined under this EGM assumption, but that's uh, no longer necessary uh, from the geometric approach. Uh, is it realistic uh, uh, improvement other examples when you don't have EGM but still have mirror algebra? Do you have any example where it works? Actually, I don't really, I mean, uh, you mean, are there examples uh, we where have... EGM is not satisfied? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But uh, how do you prove that EGM is always satisfied? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Okay. Mm, EGM is, uh, uh, it's, uh, not a, a simple condition. Mm. So fourth uh, consequence is that uh, the comparison theorem shows that the mirror algebra, as I said, just the second uh, statement, the mirror algebra is independent of choice of cluster structure, uh, which was also conjectured in the paper of GHKK. And uh, it can be shown that uh, it's possible for a variety to have uh, different cluster structures. Like we can have two different ways of writing it as a union of uh, infinite union of tori. And uh, final, uh, finally, I want to mention a consequence uh, for the comparison theorem is that it gives a geometric explanation of a change of scattering diagram under mutation. Uh, there is some complicated formula for change of scattering diagram, which can be seen from counting these non-Archimedean curves. So that's all I want to say for comparison with, for application to cluster algebra. Oh, just uh, a second, yeah, Tony. Yes. Both in cluster algebra, you, uh, you can have can construct non commutative algebras, yeah, like Q deformations. Uh, Q, so your question is how to make a quantum deformation of our counts. Yeah, and also the positivity for quantum deformations. For quantum deformation. Yeah, this uh, I don't know for the moment. <laughs> we still have to think about it. Yeah. How to make it. Uh, so, in that two dimensional case, Pierre Rick, he has some. Um, work about uh, quantum counts. But uh, I discussed with him. I... First, it's not easy how to make it work uh, for curves with boundaries. And moreover, it's not clear how to generalize to higher dimensions. Mm. But this is a very interesting uh, question. So, that's all I want to say for application to cluster algebra. And uh, if you are not familiar with uh, cluster algebra, then uh, you can ignore this. And uh, now I will explain uh, applications to the moduli space of uh, log Calabi-Yau pairs. So now we forget about uh, cluster algebra and uh, we go back to algebraic geometry. So, uh, uh, we have the following conjecture uh, in my ongoing work with Paul Shang, Paul and Shang, uh, 
concerning the moduli space of Calabria pairs. We conjecture that any connected component Q of the moduli space of triples uh, X uh, E, which is sum of uh, E1 to En and the theta, where X is a connected smooth projective complex variety. And uh, E uh, is a divisor inside the anti-canonical class. It's a normal crossing divisor with a zero stratum. Uh, zero stratum just means uh, I have uh, many intersections of pieces. So finally I get a point. Uh, and we assume that every piece is smooth. And uh, uh, the last uh, piece, theta, inside the X is an ample divisor not containing any zero stratum of E. So we consider uh, any connected component of uh, such moduli space of moduli space of such triples, and we conjecture this connected component to be unirational. So we have uh, uh, a more precise form of the conjecture above for the compactified moduli space. And I state first uh, this uh, version because in order to describe the conjecture for the compactified moduli space, we, want, we need to recall a bit more notions from birational geometry. So let's uh, now recall something from birational geometry. Uh, first, I recall the notion of a pair in birational geometry. A pair X delta consists of a reduced pure dimensional variety X and an effective Q divisor uh, delta, none of whose irreducible components is contained in the singularity of X. For example, our YD is such a pair but uh, we also allow X to be non-normal here. Then uh, I recall the notion of a KSBA stable pair. Uh, it is a proper semi-log canonical pair X delta such that KX plus delta is ample. Uh, here semi-log canonical is a condition on singularity generalizing nodal singularities to higher dimensions. And uh, then we recall that a log, uh, sorry, a Calabria pair is a proper semi log canonical pair X delta such that KX plus delta is uh, uh, rationally, Q rationally equivalent to zero. So finally, uh, a polarized log Calabria pair is a triple Xe theta, where Xe is a Calabria pair and the theta is an ample divisor not containing any semi-log canonical center of Xe. In other words, uh, if we put uh, add to E a sufficiently small multiple of H, we put E and H together, then uh, we obtain a stable pair. So what does, what does H, H? Oh, theta. It, okay. it should be theta. I'm I sorry. Should, should okay. I forgot to draw the circle. Uh, yes, so uh, yeah, let me, so I just uh, recalled four notions from birational geometry. First notion of a pair, just a variety with a divisor. And the second notion of a stable pair. So we ask that the pair has uh, manageable singularities and stability condition is the same as the usual stability condition for curves we just ask K plus the divisor to be ample. 
And then uh, we have Calabria up here, which instead of asking it to be ample, we ask it to be trivial. And finally, we have polarized the Calabria pair. It's Calabria pair together with the polarization theta. And we ask the whole thing to have manageable singularity, which has two equivalent formulation. Either we ask this polarization theta not to contain any bad center of uh, the pair, Calabria pair, or in other words, we ask that if we add a small multiple of the polarization uh, to E, then we get a stable pair. So this should be theta. Mm, maybe I can draw, but uh, my draw button is blocked by Zoom. I cannot click the draw button. Uh, I just want to add a circle here. Yes, so now uh, that's for sufficiently small epsilon. Uh, if we take x, we take the, we take uh, epsilon multiple of theta, this should be theta, epsilon multiple of theta to E, and we consider this pair, then our moduli space Q of triples X E theta immerses into SP, uh, the moduli space of stable pairs. And this SP moduli space uh, is, uh, is a generalization of uh, the Deling Manford stack MG and bar of uh, stable curves. And we let now, since our moduli space Q of triples immerses into SP, we denote Q bar, uh, the closure of Q in SP. So this SP, SP is uh, of infinite type because we can vary many things, but uh, uh, it's proven by Alexiev, Haken, McKernan, and Xu that uh, uh, connected components of uh, this moduli space SP are proper. And it's also proven uh, later that they are actually projective. So now uh, we can state a precise form of our conjecture that Q bar uh, admits a finite cover by a complete toric variety. So the weak form is uh, we conjecture Q to be unirational and, but the, and the precise form is that there is a natural compactification of Q uh, if we use uh, the right notion of singularities. If we add to Q the right degenerate, good degenerations, SLC degenerations, then uh, we get a canonical compactification and this compactified moduli space, uh, we conjectured to admit a finite cover by some proper complete uh, toric variety. And uh, with Paul and Sean, we verify our conjecture in the two dimensional case. So the theorem is that this conjecture holds when X is a del petzl surface, uh, E is anti-canonical cycle of minus one curves and the theta uh, lives in the anti-canonical linear system. So uh, the proof of uh, the theorem uh, is based on the synthetic construction of the family of triples X E theta. We study moduli space of triples and we have a construction of this moduli space of triples over the toric variety T. And this uh, family of uh, triples is an extension and a compactification of the affine mirror family we discussed above 
and which works at the same level of generality as in the Frobenius structure theorem. So the rough idea for constructing the family over T is to compactify not only fiber-wise, but also on the base of the mirror family in the Frobenius structure theorem. So let me uh, give a bit more details. Excuse me? Yes. So would you claim that uh, the combinatorial, um, well, the dual complex of E, um, e remains the same in this uh, yes. torus? T? Yes. I see. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the question. So. The idea is that we have to start uh, with YD, the mirror Calabria pair. So that uh, also explains why the two dimensional case is easier because it's self mirror in the del petal case. Uh, in general, we have to apply the mirror construction twice. And we assume that <clears throat> the interior Y minus D is a smooth affine containing a Zariski open torus. <clears throat> and uh, we also assume D to be normal crossing and the Y final. And uh, let K to Y be the canonical bundle. And we denote by K to K bar a contraction of the zero section. Mm. Yes, so now uh, the zero section is just Y. So we just uh, contract Y inside the K. And we note that uh, we have identification of Picard groups for K, uh, for K over K bar, and also for K, uh, for Y. And since what we contract is just Y, then we also have identification of uh, cone of curves of the relative k over k bar and y and identification of the nef cone. And then <clears throat> we construct a complete fan sec k over k bar uh, denoted by sec k over k bar supported on the uh, Picard vector space k over k bar called the secondary fan for YD. So it is a generalization of the classical gelfand kapranov zelovinsky secondary fan for reflexive polytopes. That's why we give it the name secondary fan. And by construction, uh, it is a coarsening of the Mori fan for K. So I will omit the construction for this talk and uh, it's some coarsening of the Mori fan and the Mori fan is a fan supported on this uh, Picard vector space which is defined using Mori equivalence relation for divisors. So just to recapitulate, I'm just explaining the idea for the construction of uh, this universal family using the mirror symmetry machine. And uh, we start with uh, some mirror funnel, YD. We take some canonical bundle and uh, contract zero section. And from this, uh, one can, uh, we construct some complete fan uh, called the secondary fan because it generalizes the classical secondary fan and also and by construction, it uses uh, some Mori theory. And next, we conjecture that the toric variety associated to this secondary fan here uh, should be the base toric variety for our family of triples, uh, X, E, theta. Um, because we, 
recall that the conjecture says that uh, the moduli space, compactified moduli space, has a cover by some toric variety. And now we make it precise that this toric variety should be uh, the toric variety associated to our secondary fan. And now recall uh, we have the affine mirror family curly V defined as a spec of our mirror algebra to spec R. Uh, R was just the monoid ring of uh, monoid ring uh, generated by curve classes. So we recall our affine mirror family from the Frobenius structure theorem this mirror family, V over spec R. And note that the dual of the cone of curves and EY is the nef cone, nef Y. So if we take spec R, it's just the toric variety associated to the nef cone. Uh, so now it's finitely generated, yeah. Now it's a final. Fun, oh, fun, yeah, for final, yeah, I see. Yeah. Yes. For final, it's finitely generated. So, yes. So now uh, we can compactify and extend. So theorem, uh, the affine mirror variety V to the toric variety associated to the nefcon from the Frobenius structure theorem uh, compactifies and extends to a mirror family, to a family of uh, Calabria pairs, curly X, curly E, to this complete toric variety, the toric variety associated to the secondary fan. And moreover, we have an ample divisor theta uh, in the total space, such that the generic fiber uh, X uh, together with the E plus some sufficiently small multiple of theta is a stable pair for sufficiently small epsilon. So the theorem just says that in the our final context, we can not only fiberwise compactify but we can also compactify the base and we obtain a proper, a family of Calabria pairs over this complete base, which is toric variety associated to the secondary fan. And furthermore, there is a canonical theta divisor given by vanishing of some sum of theta functions such that if we can take a generic fiber, then this becomes a stable pair. In other words, X E theta becomes a polarized Calabria pair. And we conjecture this stability to hold, uh, we conjecture this stability to hold not just for generic fiber, but for all fibers. But currently we can only prove it uh, in dimension two, the stability for all fibers. So here is uh, the precise, yes. So do you have canonical choice of theta as a divisor? Yes, it's a canonical theta. Uh -huh. yeah, only depending on, I see. Depending on the data we in the uh -huh. setup. Yes. So here is the precise statement in the two dimensional case. We assume Y to be smooth del petal surface. Then the family of pairs XE over the toric variety of the secondary fan is a flat family of Calabria pairs. Meaning it has semi logonautical singularities and has a trivial uh, canonical class. And the second, this boundary is a trivial family of a cycle of rational curves. 
So the boundary is everywhere and it's uh, trivial. And the third, for every fiber over the structural torus of the base toric variety, uh, X is a del petal surface with at worst dual singularities. Then, and the E, the boundary E is an anti-canonical cycle of uh, rational curves uh, of kx degree minus one, because here we have singularities, so it's difficult to talk about self-intersection. We talk about intersection with the canonical class. And furthermore, we can compute that the self-intersection number of the anti-canonical class is equal to the number of irreducible components of D. Uh, it's interesting to compute the self-intersection number because by definition, this is called the degree of a del petal surface. And uh, then for sufficiently small epsilon, if we add an epsilon multiple of our divisor theta to the boundary E, we get a family of stable pairs. And finally, we show that the induced map from the toric variety associated to the secondary fan to the moduli space of stable pairs is a finite map. Mm. So that's a detailed description in the two-dimensional case. And we see that uh, over, so our base is a toric variety. And the fibers, they are SLC. Some fibers are not normal, but we, but over the structural torus of the base, the fibers are pretty nice. They are normal, and they are actually del petal surface with uh, canonical singularities. So, finally. I state a corollary of the theorem. If we start with a smooth complex del petal surface Y and the D in Y, an anti-canonical cycle of minus one curves, then the generic fiber of the mirror family is smooth. And the one fiber will be the original YD. And if we consider the image of the finite map from this toric variety associated to the secondary fan to SP, the moduli space of stable pairs, then we show that the image is just the closure Q bar that we talked uh, uh, before, mentioned before. For the moduli space Q of triples X E theta uh, for the original YD. So that verifies uh, the precise form of our conjecture in the two-dimensional del petal surface case. But in higher dimensions, uh, it's still very difficult. We need the full mirror symmetry machine to work in full generality in higher dimensions uh, for all possible singularities in order to consider the question for the moduli space of Calabria pairs. So that's all I want to explain today. And for the next lecture, I will start by uh, recalling, by explaining some basic notions of uh, essential skeleton uh, following the work of uh, uh, Temkin, which generalizes uh, uh, Kondasevich Soboman and many other authors. Uh, and then I will talk about the skeletal curves in the next lecture. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if there are a few, we have maybe a few minutes for questions, if somebody wants to ask. Okay, thanks. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do understand that uh, there are many things to do. For example, you have to remove to open torus condition. Yeah. Yes, and... that's the first. That's also, uh, but uh, for the 
Frobenius structure conjecture, uh, the affinity assumption we must keep. Yes. Otherwise, we don't have a finiteness of sums. We only have a formal, formal mirror families. Yeah. Also, you, have to, yeah. you have to prove that mirror to mirror is a regional variety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to somehow automatically include your right in the family. Yes, so this uh, uh, application to the moduli spaces uh, really requires everything to be figured out yeah. in the mirror symmetry world. Okay. So, so, so uh, yeah. may I ask? <clears throat> so for the fifth uh, claim in the, so yes. just this in, uh, induced map, I mean, uh, yes. it's already there. I mean, the map from the toric to the moduli. Yes. So it, you mean it to be dominant also? Just as it cannot be dominant because SP okay. is so big, it contains yeah, yeah, yeah. everything. Okay. I see. Okay. But uh, it uh, dominates, uh, yeah, but here in the corollary, we further prove that it dominates a connected component. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but in uh, general, like there's a, well, some possibility that when this XE is fixed, but the theta can move, right? A theta can yeah. always move. Even in our example, theta is allowed to move. Uh huh. So why are x and e uh, fixed? X and e can also move. But why? I mean, is there some direction where x and e are fixed while theta only theta moves? That's no. a subspace. Yeah, but it's not non trivial. But if oh. only zeta moves, it's just a projective space. It's a linear system. So oh, but open, open part of the, oh, open, open part, part. yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, we need a zeta in this uh, uh, question because uh, without a zeta, the moduli space uh, doesn't uh, compactify. The nice compactification is only possible if we put a zeta. It's like in the story for the Delin bound for the stack of curves. We only have the moduli space of the stable curves. Otherwise, we cannot compactify. So theta is like auxiliary polarization mm -hmm. in order to have a nice compactification. And the uh, stratification induced by the so this map respects the stratification. I mean, the, you have a stratification which uh, can be defined by the combinatorial structure of the XE. And also you have toric structure. So it's, so you have toric stra uh, stratification. Yeah, here we, you mean we have, uh, it's a toric variety, so we have toric strata. Yeah. On the other hand, you can consider the stratification by thinking of a combinatorial structure of the XE, the dual complex. But the dual so, complex is fixed. Oh. Oh, you e. mean in the compactification? In the compactification? Yeah, in the compactification, yes. Yeah, in the compactification, the dual complex uh, will be subdivided. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, it, that's what I meant. Yes. So the two stratification coincide on? It's know, not, not clear. clear. Uh, okay. We have a fairly explicit description, uh -huh. uh, but uh, they do not coincide, even in the two dimensional case from the oh. explicit description. Because I think that even if we go to some boundary strata, the dual complex may not change, may not necessarily change. Okay. I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think it's now really time to stop and thank you again to Sony for the oh. beautiful lecture. And thank you very much. And continue. I close the meeting now. Okay. So I will put the slides also to my website. 
Yeah, it was, I think it was through the web page for the seminar at HS. Yeah. Yes. So see you again uh, on Thursday.